All right. Morning, everybody. Friday. Friday. Everybody ready for the weekend? Exciting weekend spent working on assignment three. All right. So uh, my original plan was that I would um, finish up talking about performance today, and the next week we would talk about virtualization. But as I started writing these lectures about performance, I realized that there's actually a lot to talk about. So hopefully I'm not you know, really boring people by going too slow, but in, you know, in terms of the, the, the material, which I think I described as a pantheon the other day of, of fascinating and important information that you're learning in this class, uh, you know, I want to spend some time here because I think this is important stuff. I also think it's likely that um, you will be able to use this in other places. Yeah, it's a, this is a light crowd today. I feel like the room is more echoey. There's fewer warm bodies in here. So. Um, all right, so, so today we're going we're gonna to do lecture two on performance, and then on Monday I'm actually going to do another lecture on performance where we're going to focus Monday on, on what do you actually do, like what are ways to improve the performance of, the, of your system, right? So on Wednesday we talked a little bit about the challenges inherent in, in improving performance. Um, today we're going to continue to talk about some of the pitfalls to performance improvement, uh, some of the things that you might uh, encounter and, and need to do along the way in order to sort of find uh, figure out where to spend your energy, right? I mean, you're, you're a limited human being. You only have a certain number of hours in the day. And you want to work on the part of the problem that's going to produce the biggest improvement, right? Biggest bang for your buck. So we'll talk today about trying to figure out exactly what that is, OK? Um, work on assignment three. Not much else to talk about here. Uh, I've, you know, I'm going to send an email out today. I've been meeting with people in my office. Uh, and we've, we've talked a little bit about uh, the assignment, and, and I have some uh, suggestions about ways to approach things in terms of what to implement first, and then we'll also give you some idea of how we're going to test your assignments, right? What, what programs you should be able to run where, and kind of like where are stopping points in the assignment that you can get to if you're, you know, in, in terms of like finding good places where you might want to, you know, get your code to and then maybe tag it there so that just in case you don't uh, get things completely working, you have a, something working to submit, right? So, so yeah, that'll, that'll be out today. All right, so any questions about Monday's material on, wait, today's Friday. Friday, right. Wednesday's material, or Monday's material, doesn't really matter, although I can't even remember what we talked about on Monday. Um, any questions about the stuff we talked about Wednesday? So Wednesday we started to talk about uh, performance analysis. We talked about the difficulties inherent in measurement. And we started to get into a little bit of benchmarking. We're going to keep talking about benchmarking today. But any questions on the stuff we covered Wednesday? Wednesday, Wednesday. All right, so just a couple of questions. So who, who remembers? I mean, you know, I, I put this up on the board, and we, we thought this was easy. We could all just go home early at, at you know, 9.30. Um, what, what's difficult? Who can remind me about some of the challenges inherent in improving the performance of you know, a real system or even just the performance of any piece of code? I'm going to start over in the, let's see here. I don't pick on you guys enough. Anybody remember, anyone who was here Wednesday, remember what was difficult about improving the performance of a real system? Anybody who's got the slides from last time up on their laptop? <laughs> Any guesses from here, Alec? I mean, there, there actually were quite a few things, right? So, so there should be, a, should be a lot to pick from here. You don't know. All right, anybody from this side of the room? Left side of the room. Represent nothing. You guys got nothing. Man, this is Friday. Ooh, OK. All right, right side of the room. Anybody want to uh, show these guys up? Yeah. Uh, like the measurement changes when we repeat the experiment. Right, so it's, it's very, re experiments aren't necessarily repeatable, right? That, that can be frustrating. You run an experiment. You get a result, you start working on a piece of code, and then you go back to run the experiment again, and you know, it sends you in a totally different direction, right? So the, the, the difficulty in, in experiment repeatability, OK. I'm gonna, now that the right side has contributed to the left side, I'm going to give you guys another chance. Anybody over here want to wanna throw something into the hat? Something that's difficult about performance analysis and improvement. All right, I'm going back to the well, right side. I, I feel like this side of the room is a little bit more awake today. OK, anybody else? Any other? Contributions. Timing. Measuring time, right? We talked just, just something as simple as measuring the amount of time that has passed on a system, right, can be, can be itself challenging. Now, these guys are really, really giving it to you today. Yeah, Scott. Um, measuring the results can actually affect results. 
Right, right, right. So, and that's actually kind of what we're going to talk about today. Finding ways to, to affect the results, right? Like finding out which pieces of code are actually contributing to the problem, and, and then on Monday we'll talk about some... Ah, right, right, right. Yes, the, the, you know, the, 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 the system's measurement uncertainty principle, right? Measuring the system itself, it, it can create two problems, right? It can either make the system so slow that it's unusable, or it just might destroy some sort of subtle effect that you're trying, trying to understand, right? So yeah, so, okay, great. Um, so yeah, so this, this was our basic uh, blueprint of how to do things, but we talked about, again, some of the things that are so hard here, right? How do you measure the system? How do you even measure time, right? And then today we'll talk a little bit about what should the system be doing when you measure it, right? How, how do you develop good benchmarks that allow you uh, that, you know, a good benchmark means that if you improve the performance of the benchmark, you're doing something useful. A bad benchmark means that if you improve the performance of the benchmark, nobody will care because nobody will actually notice in real life, right, when they're really using your system, all right? Um, we'll talk a l just a, a little bit today. I mean, this is not a course on probability and statistics, but I think that there's some general level of statistical hygiene that's important for, for computer programmers to have. D how many people have taken a course on statistics? Is that required for the major here? To be, to be a computer scientist and engineer at UB, must one take a statistics class? Does anybody know? What's that? Oh, whoops, the wrong one. <laughs> statistics would have been more useful. Um, OK, oh, probability, probability is close, right? But statistics would be more helpful. Um, at least I think so, right? So, so unfortunately, computer systems people are kind of like notoriously allergic to statistics. So we'll talk a little bit today about, about some of the little minimal amount of statistical hygiene that might help you out when you're trying to understand and do things. And then, yeah, so, so determining why I capitalized the sentence the way I did, um, but you know, determining what to improve and then finding techniques for ways to improve it. So today we're going to talk about the kind of what to improve. How do we choose the parts of the code that we're going to spend our time on? And then on Monday we'll, we'll go over some sort of, sort of classic techniques, different sort of tried and true methods of improving the performance of a piece of code. Right? You sit down with a piece of code, it's not performing well, what do you do? Right? So that's kind of like, that's, that's the last question you have to ask, and in some ways one of the more fun ones. All right? OK, so remember we talked a little bit about the fact that because you know, we, we, we started and we got into this whole litany of complaints and problems and challenges about experimenting on real live systems, right? Either real live systems that are in active use, which is very difficult to do, right? Because people don't want you to and because you're going to slow down the system. Or even real live systems that you're trying to run real benchmarks on, like a real computer, a real piece of hardware. And so we came up with these two other approaches, right? One was modeling, the other was simulation. Who remembers some of the pros and cons of modeling versus simulation, right? Ben. Um, well, with simulation, you can get repeatable results. Right, so simulations will produce repeatable results, and that's good, right? That, that can be in contrast to real systems that are very, very difficult to produce repeatable results on simply because they're almost never in the same state twice, right? With the simulator, again, you're, you're, you're scraping some complexity off the system in hopes that this will allow you to, to understand it better and make the necessary improvements. What about models? What's something good about a model? Well, well okay, so strong, I would say strong mathematical conclusions, right? Like the conclusions that you get out of a model can be very strong and, and, and frequently can, are, are, are provable conclusions, right? They're, they're hard conclusions. What's the problem with models? Unrealistic assumptions. Unrealistic assumptions, right? Normally, to get the system into a state where we can model it and we can say things about it you know, with mathematical certainty means that we have to make so many unrealistic assumptions that the system that we're, that we're modeling, the system that we're using these analytic techniques to try to understand, bears potentially little to no resemblance to the system that we were actually trying to improve in the first place. All right? So that, that's kind of a challenge, right? What's one of the downfalls about simulations? The simulator, right? I've got to write a simulator. Right? Now I've introduced this whole extra piece of code that has to be correct. Right? It was hard enough before where I had code that had to be correct, the code that actually had to work that was running on my real system. Now I've essentially asked the person who's trying to improve the performance of something, hey, by the way, go out and write a bunch of other code that also has to be correct 
and then use that code to experiment with the code that you were trying to work on in the first place. Right? So yeah, simulators can have bugs, right? So models, we can make strong mathematical guarantees after making a bunch of unrealistic assumptions, right? Simulations, in the best case, you know, uh, the simulator is simpler and faster to work on than the real system, and in the worst case, the simulator some of the, I mean, there's two things that can go wrong with simulators. Well, there's many things that can go wrong with simulators, right? One is that the assumptions that we make or the complexity that we remove in designing the simulator renders the simulated results meaningless. The other problem is that the simulator itself can have problems, right? All right, any other questions on Wednesday's material before we go bravely onward? Questions about this sort of stuff. You guys feel ready for the first step and a half of performance analysis in Benjamin? Maybe we should add a performance assignment as part of assignment three. You know, you guys have plenty of time. I'll just add a little extra. There seems to be no, yeah, okay. I mean, no, nobody seems opposed. Um, all right, probably not. <laughs> What's that? You're just in shock? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys are it's like Stockholm Syndrome by this point, you know? Um, all right, <laughs> so what, and, and okay, so this is, this is a little bit of review from last time too, right? We talked a little bit about, you know, what, what does it mean, right? So, so now we're getting to the point where we figured out how to measure, we've decided which approach we're gonna take, modeling, simulation, or, you know, trying to work on a real system. Now the question is, what do we, like what code do we actually have running in the first place, right? What inputs do we use into the system? And, you know, and what metrics do we use as comparison metrics, right? So the first part is, you know, what do we use to run on the system? The second part is, what do we use to evaluate the outputs, right? And we talked about how difficult it can be to compare things, right? I mean, what does it mean to compare two disk drives, right? Or two different scheduling algorithms, or I wish I could had eyes in the back of my head so I could remember what was on the slide without looking. Two page replacement algorithms, right? Or two file systems. I mean, these are big, complicated things that have many different performance outputs, right? And so finding a way to compare these is really difficult, right? And, and the other thing we're talking about today is frequently, you know, you have to be careful that in improving the performance of, of one part of the system, you don't make changes to other parts inadvertently that destroy those performance gains. So we talked, I mean, you guys might remember this a little bit, right? So, so what, what system have we already discussed that potentially had this problem? A system that, that made a really dramatic improvement to a certain thing that the system did, but potentially had this, like, all this dirt that was brushed under the rug in order to do this. Who remembers what we've already talked about? that had this potential problem. What's that? Log structured file systems, right? So remember we talked about log structured file systems. It was this like revelation, right? We could do all the writes to the disk in the same place. Woohoo! And then it was like, oh crap, we gotta clean the disk. And it's like, oh, okay. So, you know, so again, I mean, so, sometimes you, you feel like you're, you're, you're working with the proverbial tablecloth that's too small, right? No matter how hard you yank it into one corner, it pops up somewhere else, right? You just need to be careful when you're improving performance of your system that you're not doing things that are gonna jeopardize the performance of every other part of the system, right? All right, so, and yeah, I put this up just because, you know, I like to have a picture in every set of slides. Um, all right. So let's talk about benchmarks, right? Usually we can, we can break down uh, benchmarks, right? So, who, who, so first of all, let's just define the term, right? What is a benchmark? What is a benchmark? Anybody? What's that? A standard. It, okay, there is something standard about it. I will take the word standard from your answer and I will use it. <laughs> Contribute it to the right answer. What else? So benchmarks are standard what? What's that? It's something you can compare to. Okay, so it's something that we, we, we do use as a point of comparison, but, but why, right? So it's a standard point of comparison. Right, if we do the results carefully, they are comparable, and we would hope that they would be objective, right? But, but why, why, why use benchmarks, right? What's the alternative, right? So imagine I've got the file systems community, right? And if, without benchmarks, what do people end up doing? Yeah. They end up writing their own test. They, they, or they might use some sort of application benchmark, right? But, but you, you can't compare things, right? Like, you know, you, you know, you had some sort of performance problem that led you to implement a new scheduling algorithm, and you ran it on your workload, and it worked great, you know? 
And I don't know. Keith had a different performance problem. He wrote a completely different scheduling algorithm, and it's so great on his workload, right? But I don't know, you know, I, I need to pick one of yours, and I don't know which one is quote unquote better, right? So bench, the, the, the ideal benchmark gives us a way to compare apples and apples, right? When you talk about file system benchmarks, the idea is benchmarks are supposed to represent the, some, sort, some degree of representative requirements. Right? You know, what do most applications' file system usage patterns look like? Right? Because if I'm trying to evaluate file systems, I want to pick the file system that works best for a, a specific set of applications. Now, now, what's the problem with benchmarks for this very same reason? What's the challenge with, ben with, with, with developing a good benchmark? <laughs> you need a benchmark for your benchmark, right? So, so right. So, so different benchmarks might 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 succeed or fail. But kind of like, what's what's the what's what's the like the existential challenge of benchmarks, right? I mean, on some level, as benchmarks, you know, I, I would love a benchmark that allowed me to compare every different aspect of file system performance, right? Or I would, or let's put it this way, I would love a benchmark that reflected every possible application that could ever use the system, right? But what's the what's what's the problem with that benchmark? It's almost impossible to cover everything. Why? Right? What's true about applications and processes that use computer operating systems? They're different, right? They have different requirements. And so, you know, it's kind of like you, 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 you're like, okay, I had this great idea. I'm going to come up with a benchmark that allows me to compare any two file systems, right? And then you start looking at different applications. You say, I'm going to use that application, and that application does this. And pretty soon you have something that's so general that it's meaningless, right? It doesn't really reflect any individual application, right? But it reflects some sort of, like, it's like, well, you know, all the applications do reads, right, or something, right? So there's, there's some, you know, tension here in benchmarks between generality. Because generality allows benchmarks to be powerful, allows it, you to say, this, if I do well on this benchmark, it means that I'm going to improve the, lots of different applications' performance, right? But as benchmarks get more general, they also stop being reflective of the applications that are contained in them, right? Because a database application is on some level very, very, very different than a gaming application, right? In terms of how it uses the file system. Trying to come up with a benchmark that, that you know, improves the performance of both is, is very difficult, right? All right, but let's talk about these sort of different categories of benchmarks, right? So who knows, what a, who, who knows or can guess what, a, what is a micro benchmark? Ben. Uh, I don't like Right. So micro benchmarks try to isolate, you know, one aspect of system performance, right? Very, very, very specific, but you know, you're you're trying to look at one, one, one very, very tiny little thing, right? And usually you're you why are you usually using a micro benchmark? Why would you be trying to to, to observe or isolate the performance of one specific part of the system? Checking for bottlenecks, but, but what is more likely, what is more likely to be the thing that you are doing at this time that you are using this micro benchmark? You're working on that part of the system, right? So you want to be able to isolate your changes from other noise that's affecting other parts of the system, right? Okay, excuse me. Similar vein, macro benchmarks, right? So what's a macro benchmark? Micro benchmark isolate one specific part of the system. Macro benchmark. It tries, to, yeah, I mean, it tries to look at holistic system performance, right? It tries to see, you know, how does the whole system as, as an entire uh, blob, you know, perform, right? Given some sort of general workload, right? Okay, now, now let, let's find some sort of uneasy un middle ground here. Application benchmark, right? What is an application benchmark? Or an application, or a class of, uh, an application, that you talk about, you know, benchmarks that represent classes of applications, right? So a macro benchmark is trying to like say, you know, oh, okay, over all different types of workloads, this is how the system would respond. Micro benchmarks is trying to isolate one specific aspect of system performance. So an application benchmark is doing what? what what's the most direct way to measure the improvement provided to an application by a change you're making to the system? What's the most obvious thing to do? Run the application, right? 
I'm trying to improve the performance of the file server, right? Or I'm sorry, I'm trying to improve the performance of a web server, right? This is my goal. I'm trying to make changes to the to the file system specifically to better support web servers, right? So run a benchmark or run a specific application that is that type of application, right? Run a run a web server on the system and measure its performance, right? So you you have these application benchmarks that can represent specific classes of applications, right? And, and you know how well would a data would a typical database workload, right? A database is a class of application, right? But you could also just run you know a standard version of a particular database with a given workload and look at how well it performs, right? All right. So this is one sort of taxonomy of benchmarks. Um, so let's talk about Examples. Let's try to come up with a few examples of each one, right? And let's say, let's do this in the context of um, we're trying to improve the performance of our virtual memory system, right? So, you know, you know, on Monday or Tuesday when you guys get done with assignment three, you realize your system's kind of slow, and you decide that you want to make some changes and improve it, right? So, so what are what are some micro benchmarks that we could develop to to focus on specific aspects of the performance of our virtual memory system? Give me one example. What's one sort of atomic unit of operation or specific thing that the virtual memory system might do, or a specific part of the virtual memory system we might want to isolate and be able to? Okay. What 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 about I me? Mean, paging is well, broad. So what about page? Page eviction. What what? Okay. See, I'm 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 gonna, you know, what about page eviction? Right. So, so, okay, so I could measure how long it takes to swap a page to disk, right? I, w I would argue that's not really a, f a VM benchmark, though, right? That's more dependent on file, on disk performance, right? But let's think, as say I'm thinking about page eviction, what, what are parts of that that are specific to the virtual memory system? What does the virtual memory system have to do before it pages something to disk? It has to decide which one to evict, so what could I benchmark about that? How long it takes to decide, right? Okay, so my, my, my first one here that I actually put up was time to handle a single page fall, right? Now this is kind of funny because this, this, this you might argue is not even really micro enough, right? Because this involves lots of other parts of the system potentially. And as we'll talk about a little bit, this, you know, what, what's, what's the difficult thing about benchmarking sort of overall page fault handling performance, right? If I just ran the system and I, I, I measured how long it took to handle each page fault and I computed an average, right? What's the problem with that? Well, okay, it might depend on the performance of other things, but what's well, what's another problem? Right. There's so many different things that can happen here, right? There's a fast path where the page is in memory. There's a slightly slower path where I have to load a translation into the TLB. There's an even slower path where I have to evict something. You know, I might have to zero fill pages. So I've started to lump so many different cases together that this isn't really a micro benchmark anymore, right? So this, that's a, uh, So time to look up page in the page table. Here's another example of a micro benchmark, right? I say to your address-based functions, you know, find this page. You know, what's, what's the physical address for this page? How long does it take to, to figure that out, right? Depending on how you implement your page tables, this will vary, right? And then how long does it take to choose a page to evict, right? So whatever your page replacement algorithm is doing, you know, however, you know, smart it is and all these different AI techniques that I'm sure you guys are going to apply to this problem, you know, how long does it take bef between the point when you figure out that you need to evict a page and you select a page for eviction, right? How long does this take? And of course, this is a function of how you do it, right? So here are some event, uh, example micro benchmarks. What about macro benchmarks? What about macro benchmarks for for your for your VM? Any guesses? Any ideas? Yeah, John. So you could uh, do a context switch and figure out how long it takes to do all of the garbage associated with that, like Okay, yeah, so I, I would argue that might even be more of a micro bench, but, but you're right, you're starting to combine multiple things in there, right? So there's, there's starting to be, to, yeah, so, you know, context switch overhead, right? So, so that's, that's one, like, maybe medio benchmark, yeah. How long does it take to start the kernel? That's, that's not a bad thing. That requires a lot of page faults. Okay, what about, can we, can we recycle something from the list we already have up here? What about, you know, again, just aggregate time to handle page faults, right? So I take a system, I run some sort of, uh, you know, heavy he uh, benchmark that pages heavily, and then I just look at the average time that it takes, or the, or the page fault 
throughput, right? How many faults per second can I handle, right? Um, and then, you know, page, again, page fault rate, right? So the page fault rate is an interesting indication of how effective the system is at handling page faults, right? The page fault rate can go up for a variety of reasons, right? One of the reasons might be that I'm doing a, you know, a better job of keeping pages in core. I'm doing a better job of selecting pages to move to swap. And so I'm handling more faults because the fault handling path is faster and the throughput of the system is improving, right? The page fault rate could also go up because I'm doing a bad job, right? And, and I'm, I'm evicting things from the TLB that shouldn't be evicted, right? So, so this is why macro benchmarks start to be complex because the fluctuation of them is not necessarily clear, right? All right, and then application level benchmarks. So, right, you guys have some of these, right? I, I, I can't claim that these are really like super realistic, useful applications, right? Like triple sort, right? I'm going to sort three large arrays of numbers, right? I mean, I guess that's a benchmark, right? I don't know why you would do three all at once, but anyway, so, so we've given you actually some application level benchmarks, and these can be used. And, and you can use these, right? If you guys want to experiment with your system, you can run these several times and you can look at the results, right? All right, so, so what about challenges using these, these various types of benchmarks, right? So what, what would be, and I think people have already kind of hinted at some of these, what about the problems with micro benchmarks? What's, a, what's one problem with, with a micro benchmark? I have a question. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Right. Yeah, so, so there is some overlap between macro benchmarks and application benchmarks. Right? Um, the, the difference is that macro benchmarks are supposed to reflect some higher level component of system behavior that you can argue would be potentially important to all applications, right? Where application benchmarks are allowed to zero in on system performance, you know, uh, components of system performance that are specifically important to a particular application. Right? This is why you have these classes, you know, for example, database workloads, right? Because databases use operating systems in many ways that are kind of unusual. Actually, it's been kind of a running complaint by the database community for years and years that operating systems don't do a good job of supporting database workloads because databases do kind of weird things, right? Like databases will, you know, be, because of how databases store information, they, they really kind of almost want raw access to the disk, right? They don't want a file system in the way, right? So, so even just providing them a file abstraction, they start to get annoyed about, right? Because they're like, you know what? You know, I'm like, I imagine if you have your own data structure that you're laying out in a file, right? Well, now that file is going to be in different parts on disk, and what you really wanted is just give me a partition, right? Just give me a chunk of the disk that I can, and I can lay out things myself. I know better than you do, right? So this has been a source of kind of research and continued conversation between the database and, and operating system communities, right? But yeah, there is overlap between those two classes of benchmarks. It's definitely true. All right, you guys have had time to think. Problems with micro benchmarks. Kind of an obvious problem with a micro benchmark, right? I've got a micro benchmark. I've zeroed in on some very, very specific part of the system. I've doubled its performance, and what? What's right, so, so I think you guys basically said the same thing, which is that I don't know what I did to the rest of the system. Actually, there's two problems with this. We're going to get to these later. The first is, I don't know what I did to the rest of the system. The second is, who cares? Maybe that part of the system doesn't even matter. Right? So, so yeah, there's, there's a, uh, so yeah, this is my, <laughs> this is my way. You know, you may not be studying the right thing, and the thing that you're improving may actually have del del deleterious effects on other parts of the system. Right? So you may, you may be, you know, your, your small performance improvement to something that doesn't matter may cause a significant performance degradation to something that does matter. Right? So that would, that's kind of the worst possible case. Right? Uh, macro benchmarks, you're kind of talking about the ob op opposite set of problems. Right? You know, you're, you're, you're at such a high level that it's not clear exactly what fluctuations are caused by. And you know, like we talked about page fault rate. Right? Well, page fault rate can go up. Uh, you know, the, the page fault throughput can go up and down for a variety of reasons. Jason? Right. That would actually happen. He's put me on the spot here. Um, so it's probably going to be difficult to come up with a convincing example. Um, but I'm trying to think about something in the context of VM, too, because that would be easiest, right? Um, well, OK. I mean, here, here's an example, right? It's possible that um, you. 
you know, it's possible that you're, you're trying to improve the page eviction, like the, the speed at which you can find a page to evict, right? So you, you've identified locating a page to swap to disk as a bottleneck in your system and you're trying to improve that, right? And by doing so, you come up with that you use a different algorithm that potentially evicts pages in a different order, right? And it turns out that the ordering that you choose is, is poor, right? And so what happens is you're moving the wrong pages to disk, right? And the overhead now of doing I.O. back and forth because you're, you're evicting the wrong pages overwhelms the small improvement that you made, right? So there's a, there's a case where there's a balance between two components of the system, right? You know, it, the right thing to do if I wanted to over, improve overall performance might be to write a smarter page eviction algorithm that takes longer, right? So, you know, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about VM. It's possible that the extra, you know, 1,000, 10,000 cycles that I spend on the page eviction path, if that prevents me from doing one additional I.O., it's worth it, right? So, so yeah, so that's, that's a case. And, yeah, that's a case where you would probably be conscious of that because if, if, if you weren't an idiot, you might think, oh, okay, well, you know, I, I, I'm fundamentally altering an algorithm on the system that's going to affect other things, right? But if you get too myopic, Right? If you get too focused on that one thing and you're not running you know, higher level benchmarks, you might miss the fact that, oh yeah, by the way, you know, the, the system is significantly slower now because of the improvement that you made. Right? So we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a sec. All right? So yeah, so macro benchmarks, there's so much going on that it can be difficult to actually come to real specific conclusions about the results. And so what a lot of what a lot of analyses do is they start with microbenchmarks. They use microbenchmarks to draw conclusions about some of the changes they've made, and then they use macrobenchmarks to kind of prove to you that they haven't you know, totally destroyed the overall performance of the system as a result, right? And then hopefully they've made some improvements, right? So it's kind of the application. The, the macrobenchmark is I've improved the system. The microbenchmark is to prove to you that the changes that I made to a specific component of the system are actually the source of the improvement and not some other thing. Right, or some other in weird interaction between parts of the system. Right? And then application benchmarks always have this kind of uh, provinciality to them. Right? I mean, that's just your application. Right? And who cares? Right? So it, you know, if, if I'm you know, trying to improve web server performance and I make all these changes to the file system and the web per server performance goes up you know, by a factor of two or three, that's great. Right? But if, you know, 90, if most of the users that are logged into your system are trying to read email and the performance of the email clients just went down, then you know, they, they may not care that the pages are loading somewhat faster from your web server. What they probably care about is that you know, Pine is really slow. Right? Um, so this, this, is, this is an important issue. Right? All right. The, in, and, and I think you know, it's, it's worth pointing out a little bit of the psychology of how benchmarks work out in practice too. Right? One, of the, one of the biggest problems with benchmarks, I mean, what, or, or anticipate a problem with, with benchmarking, right? You are, you're working on improving the performance of your system, and you know, you've figured out how to measure things, you've chosen a benchmark, you run some tests, the benchmark improves, and you know, you're ready to brag about your results, right? So what, what, what's, what's the, what, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to accuse you of anything, uh, but what's po what is it possible that has happened along this path? What do, what do people do when they select benchmarks? Or what people, what might people do? Yeah, John. Well, you could write you know, a little hack specifically to improve performance on that benchmark that don't necessarily have to do with the system. Right. Now, I mean, who, no one would ever do that, right? And they don't necessarily have to be, like, hacks, right? They might, like, the problem is you, you get too wedded to your own benchmark. The first thing is you pick the benchmark, right? So that's kind of like, for example, you know, that would be like me saying, hey, guys, uh, how many people would like to have a final where you write the exam, right? And then, uh, actually, maybe that's what we'll do. Maybe I'll have you guys submit exam questions, and then I'll create an exam from the questions you submitted, right? That will give people an incentive to submit questions, too, because if you submit a question, then you should probably know the answer. Yeah, that's just an idea. Anyway, but if I asked you to write, like, I think we can do this in a crowdsourced way and actually have it be cool. If I actually asked you to write your own exam, right, and then have you come in and take it, that would probably introduce some sort of problem. I would hope you guys would do well. Um, <laughs> but don't write an exam that you can't get 100 on, please. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's kind of like people are, and, and you know, I mean, you have to, 
you know, good, good people who have good, you know, ethics and, and good scientific practice try to do the right thing. But there's actually there's a lot of evidence, and I wish I had looked this up, you know, from from earlier, you know, scientific eras, that that this is always a problem, right? And it's not the function of just people who are who are trying to pass off bad results. It's just a function of people who get so embedded in a problem, right? And and so determined to improve things that they start to see things in their data and they start to choose experimental methods that are really tailored to what they're doing in ways that, that, that render their conclusions very, very difficult to re reproduce. Yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah, of course, right. I mean, no, the, the answer is not hard, right? I mean, running a bunch of benchmarks is usually a good idea, right? But, but again, I mean, you'd be surprised at how many papers get published because running benchmarks takes a lot of time, and it's also equally frustrating when you run another benchmark and the system doesn't improve. Right? You're like, oh, crap. Now, maybe, maybe I won't use that benchmark in my paper. Um, so, I mean, I remember re reading just recently, actually, that it's something like, I don't know, there's this shocking number of, of, of studies in psychology and, and, and medicine that produce really exciting results the first time they're performed. But every time they're reproduced, the results go de like the, the, the results diminish, right? And actually, there's people who are studying this in the medical community because they don't know why this is. It's something very strange. But there's all these you know, different, different uh, claims that people have made that looked fantastic you know, the first time they were published. And then as people have tried to reproduce them, they get harder and harder to reproduce, right? So, 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 it's, so again, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily people with, with bad intentions. Sometimes it's just people who are, you know, it's just some feature of how this happens, right? Um, all right, so yeah, uh, you know, again, people choose benchmarks that, you know, to try to justify the changes they want to make. And also people uh, choose benchmarks and then work on the system to the point where their work becomes coupled to that benchmark. Right, starts to lose a little bit of its mooring with reality, right? Um, and, and again, I just want to point out that this isn't just like human weakness, right? Uh, what, so so what, what can we say? I mean, this is, this is interesting because if we get to virtualization, which I hope we will, we'll talk a little bit about, about virtualization as a solution to this problem, right? But, but operating systems have this tough job, right? They're trying to support a lot of different applications, right? So wh what is, you know, if you're an operating system designer, what's one may, way to make, and, and you've got a client. Let's say you're, I don't know, you're Microsoft or something, and your big client is Oracle, right? And, Oracle's databases, right? Like they are running a specific application on your system, and that's what they care about, right? So, what is one way to make them happy, right? What is one way to, to make your operating system better from the perspective of Oracle? So customize it. To what? Right. So, the the so okay. So my my maxim here is that the fastest system is a single purpose system, right? And, and to the degree that people continue to work on single applications, again, like the, the, the best way to, to or, or one way to improve performance of a system is just to tailor it more and more and more to a specific application, right? Unfortunately, at least for a large you know, class of what operating systems are still used for, for a lot of cases, this is okay now, right? Because a lot of times, operating systems are run in environments where they only support one application, right? That's kind of an interesting modern twist on the general purpose operating system. But for the types of things you, you guys do, right? I mean, you probably, you might, you may or may not get really upset if, you know, the next Android phone that you got, you know, was incredibly tuned for Angry Birds. Right? And that slowed down everything else on the system. Right? Like mail was slow, the web was slow, Angry Birds was super fast. Right? <laughs> um, so, so, or, or you might get equally upset if the web was really fast and Angry Birds was slow. Right? Whatever. I don't, I, Angry Birds is kind of my catch all uh, thing to, to, to pound on. I don't really use Angry Birds or play it. All right. Um, so, yeah, so we're, we're going even slower than I want to, which is fine. So I think that, um, so let's talk a little bit, you know, we, we've, we spent a lot of time for the first two lectures on performance talking about what not to do, right? What not to do, you know, all these mistakes to, that you can make. So I, I want to sort of uh, finish today by talking more about what to do, right? What are, what are good techniques to follow, right? So the first thing that's kind of critical is having a goal, right? Having a specific goal, right? I mean, usually, you know, th that's the problem with performance. Even vaguely defined performance seems like something that's worth doing, right? I'm just going to make my system faster, right? That actually seems like a worthwhile goal, right? You don't have to be that much more specific. If you actually want to make your system faster, however, it is really helpful to be more specific, right? So it's helpful to say, you know, 
I want to improve this particular piece of code. And, and I know we're coming to it very slowly, but we are going to talk about how to choose what to improve. right? But the more specific you can make your goal, the more likely it is that you can actually improve things. right? And, and improve things for real. Right? Not just happen to run the benchmark on a set of warm caches and have it look faster and then go home. Right? Um, and and the, the reason is, you know, the more specific you can make your goal, the more likely it is that you can identify changes that you're making to the system, right? If it's just faster, right, and, and you make some changes to the code, then the change, then, you know, I mean, here's one way of thinking about it, right? Any, you know, any changes you make to your code base are likely to affect the performance of the system. Unfortunately, it's like flipping a coin, right? It might get faster or it might get slower, right? You know, absent of any sort of analytic techniques. So one way of improving performance without you know, paying any attention to this is simply to make a change, run the system. You know, if it's faster, commit that change. Right? If it's not faster, revert that change and try making another change. Right? And, and in theory, you could, do, you could do this for long periods of time. Right? Uh, I don't think that that would work very well over, over a long horizon. But if anyone wants to try that as a research project, I would love to have somebody experiment with that. It'd be kind of interesting. Um, but, but if you don't want to do that sort of like, you know, a random uh, sort of monkey approach driven, uh, you know, again, you could just imagine monkeys doing this, right? Make change to code, commit, if code works, evaluate performance. If code is faster, you know, continue. Uh, uh, so if you don't want to do that, then, then being specific helps, right? Um, so when, when you're using models and simulators, and you guys will probably use models and simulators. Validating them before you start is really important, right? And especially with simulators, this can be really frustrating because when you write a simulator, you spend time writing the simulator, you know? Like, you wanted to improve the performance of the system, and now you ended up writing code, extra code, that you didn't want to write in the first place, that's never going to ship with the product, that's not a part of the system, that no one is ever going to know about. And then when you're done with that, rather than immediately getting down to cranking out results, Someone, you know, some jerk like me is going to tell you, did you validate the simulator? And you'd be like, of course I did. I wrote it. It's right. You know? Like, I understand the code. Of course it works. Right? So before you make changes, making sure that the simulated behavior matches the real behavior of the system is really critical. It's not something that people do very often, but it's really important. Right? Because otherwise, you've created a completely different thing. Right? And changes that you make that improve the performance of the simulator what evidence do you have that they're going to improve the performance of the real system? Right? If the simulated performance doesn't match up before you start making changes, then the simulator is really not that helpful. Right? And you can do the same thing with models. Right? And, and particularly, I mean, simple models you know, should produce results that match your intuition. Right? OK. Right? So you know, an, another important thing to do is to, to, is to pick the right techniques. Right? And, and there's no real, I'm not sure there's a science to this, right? I mean, this is kind of like part of the art of performance improvement. You know? When do you use modeling? When do you come up with analytic techniques? When do you write a simulator? When do you try to do experiments on real code? When do you get a benchmark right, and use that? When do you use the workload that the customer was running? Right? I mean, these are things that are, that, you know, over time, as systems engineers and as, as programmers, you guys will start to get a feeling for, right? But you should at least know that these techniques are out there and, and think about them when you're approaching a problem, right? Think about it. You know, should I, should I model this technique, right? Is this, is this system one that I can model, right? Maybe that's a powerful approach if you can do it, right? Does a simulator already exist for this system? Can I use it to evaluate this technique, right? And, you know, I mean, and, and there's, and, and on some level, I'm not, I'm not totally sure that I, that I believe what I wrote on my own slides here, but, you know, but there's some, you know, there, there might be some, you know, hierarchy of these things, right? For example, if you can't convince yourself analytically that a new algorithm is going to improve the performance of your system, then don't bother simulating it, right? And if it doesn't work in the simulator, don't implement it on the real system, right? I mean, I think sometimes people, including myself, get so wedded to an idea that they are determined to implement it on a real system and, and try it out, because maybe it'll work. Right? But you know, the, 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 what, what people have found out over time is that, you know, things, that don't, things that don't work repeatedly usually don't work in, real, in your real system either. Right? So it's just wasted effort. All right, so I think this is a good stopping point. Does anybody have any questions about this stuff?
I'm going more slowly than I thought I would, but I'm going as fast as I want to. So, are people are people bored by this? Anybody? It's okay. I'm I'm not. I won't take it personally. Am I going too slow? I feel like I'm going too slow. Anybody want to claim I'm going too slow? Other than me. Okay. What's that? You think I'm going a little slow? Okay, that's cool. That's cool. I'll speed up on Monday. All right. So Monday, <laughs> Monday we will get through the the remainder of this material, and we will talk about a uh, few hints of ways to make your system faster. All right. Good luck with assignment three, and I will see you on Monday. Have a great weekend.